Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing platforming your data for success. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVAnalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of your screen for that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar, you can follow William and each other at community.dataversity.net. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our, speakers, our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He takes corporate information and turns it into a bottom-line producing asset. He's worked with major companies worldwide, 15 of the Global 2000, and many others. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven, streamlined approaches in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations, and he has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon, and welcome, everybody. So glad you are taking some time out of a, a most crazy day uh, out there in the world. Uh, but, you know, these, uh, these skills are, are going to be necessary when the dust settles, and now might be just a great time to, uh, to invest in yourself. And I hope uh, to be a small part of that today. We're going to talk about platforming data. Uh, across the divide of analytic and operations, a little focus here on analytic, of course. Uh, that's where there seems to be a lot of uh, uh, choices uh, these days. Um, this is a topic that in the course of an hour, I'm only going to be able to hit on a certain level of information uh, as opposed to drilling down uh, too deep. But hopefully I get you into a path that's right for you and in your current situation, because we're all out there either dealing with something that has been platformed or we are going to platform something in the near future. And uh, this is going to be ongoing. It's going to be a big part of any data professional's career. And any analytic professional's career has to do with where their data is located. And it's important that you get it right. I'm going to try to make that case here as well that it's important that you don't just pick the same old. Um, and that can really get you into trouble as you go forward and lack uh, capabilities. And a lot of that sort of thing uh, still happens, of course, but it does get smoked out in due time. And I want you to, to make a good scalable decisions here. Not that any decision is worth spending months and months and years and years to make. You gotta make it uh, based upon the information that you have uh, and use good judgment, of course, and uh, I'm just trying to add to that judgment here, that judgment mix that you bring to the table here today. So with that, okay, I've been introduced. Uh, you see a couple of my books there, and this is what we do at McKnight Consulting Group. If I can help you in any way, please uh, feel free to reach out. Uh, this is uh, sort of part of what I do all the time here is platforming uh, data. So it's a lot of fun keeping up with this industry, and I can tell you, this guy, this is the wild, wild toad, is that right, from, uh, from Disneyland. Uh, apparently, he has a pretty wild ride over there. And uh, we've been on a wild ride ourselves, haven't we, with Hadoop, with Cloud, with NoSQL, with MDM, with stream processing, with graphs, with in-memory databases, and with uh, competing, uh, shall we say, standards, if you will, about how we should be doing things and reference architectures that are completely contradictory being proposed to you out there, I know. And so it is a challenging environment. And it's important we get all our data under control. Uh, and so even as the environment becomes more challenging in terms of platforms, it's all, it's all good. It's all because the market is moving to where we sit. We sit on data. And that is really what's uh, important today in business. I, I wrote a blog entry the other day. Uh, I, I said, uh, business is about data. 
And really, uh, I mean that uh, we are in that era of give me all data fast and effectively. If for no other reason today, many of you are telling me you're getting ready for artificial intelligence and you're, you're gathering your data in a great platform or platforms, as the case may be, so that it's ready for artificial intelligence. Because you know that that's going to require a lot of data, all the data you can muster, really. So for no other reason, let's do that. Now, uh, at some point or another, I need to address the Hadoop question. And I think that probably, you know, it kind of came upon us in the 2000s and uh, still some semblance of it still around. Is it dead? Um, depends what you mean by Hadoop, right? Okay, there's about 50 projects in there, 50 plus Apache projects. I tried to count them yesterday. I ran out of time. Uh, there's so many projects that are under Hadoop anymore. It, that's alive and well. And those projects are definitely finding their way into stacks all over the place. Now, original Hadoop was HDFS and MapReduce. We're not, not really doing that so much anymore, although plenty of companies did that and still have that and haven't come to a point where they have to change that. So they're not. Now, Hadoop did come to mean a lot of on-premises uh, hardware that we are now discovering may not have been the best thing for us now that the cloud is really maturing. And so what has matured a lot is cloud databases. And that is where I'm going to make a point here today that that is where a lot of your data belongs. Uh, certainly most of it belongs in the cloud, but a lot of it belongs in these cloud analytical databases. And they've been around for a while. I, I just recalled the other day that back in 2011, Google BigQuery, I know, I know you're thinking, well, BigQuery, that just came out you know, a few years ago. Well, yeah, the update did, but it originally came out back in 2011. And uh, it really didn't catch on back then. It wasn't very good at some kinds of joins and didn't have standard SQL, not widely used. But Google made Google itself, that is, they made a lot of use of it and now make that available, of course, along with so many others. And we'll get to some of that as we go along here. Now, I did say uh, about how important artificial intelligence data is. Come back next month when I will focus on this as a topic. But this, this is a list of some of the data that you're going to want to collect for artificial intelligence. I'll go into the, the why of it more next month. But for now, if you look across this, I think you can just see on the face of it that not all of this is going to sit in one platform. There's so many different kinds of data in here, and we are definitely in the era where you have to pick the right platform for the workload. And um, there is no one size fits all, and not all of this or anything else is going to go in any one platform. So I'm asked a lot about, you know, what's the platform for AI data, or how do we architect for the AI future? And the answer right now, or I'll say my best answer right now, is to have a great architecture. Have a great architecture in place for data. Have fit-for-purpose artifacts in there. Have a great data flow, a sensible data flow, one that is one that uh, moves data sensibly with pipelines or even ETL and whatnot. So great architecture is the foundation of great platform selection. You want to do that first. You know, do the architecture selection first. You don't want to always be running to the same vendor uh, for your tooling necessarily. That can be really problematic. Now, here's another, speaking of, uh, speaking of uh, things that are bugaboos for me, it's, it's this one. It's that we focus so much on BI, uh, excuse me, uh, on the BI and the AI component of our stack, we don't focus enough on, on the data stack. But that is really the majority of where the work effort should go. And if that is done right, you can interchange and have a lot of different BI and AI stacks on top of great data, and it's all going to work harmoniously. But so many times we look at our data stack and we say, well, it's, it's insufficient. But the solution is to get another tool that sits on top that has to go through a ton of work to get to the point where it's actually doing what should be able to do just by slapping it on the data, right? And that's why these BI tools, or what now we refer to as BI tools, the clicks and the tableaus and SciSense and so on, they, uh, they're really infrastructures in and of themselves now, aren't they? 
they're not like the BI tools of yesteryear, like the business objects and Cognos and so on, that pretty much sat on data and pulled data and did its job. And they have built in a lot of, uh, of abilities for you to pull data and do certain other things. C certainly the, the trifactus and the paxatas and that lot is really famous for doing that. And the reason is because we don't have great architecture. But I still say, even with those tools in place, that the, the uh, energy needs to go into data platforms. And that's why we're here today, because there's an increased probability that platform selection is going to lead to success. If you just keep reaching for the same old platform, your chance of success of the overall project, and this isn't scientific or anything, this is just my experience at having been a part of some 70 odd programs, the, the chance of success is going to be today anyway, it's going to be pretty low, maybe 50-50. It's like throwing a dart. And success is really a relative term now, isn't it? But you kind of know when you have it enough uh, if you've been part of a project. Uh, most projects, I would say, don't get to that point, uh, unfortunately. But uh, here's, a, here's one of the reasons why. We just go for the same old platform. Or now it's a little bit better if you extend within that, uh, that vendor and get into the right uh, platform category, if you will from that vendor, but if you keep going back to the same vendor over and over again for all your platforms, that can also be pretty problematic. You're only hearing one message, one voice. And today, now that we've had about, oh, I don't know, and the, the relational model's been out about 30 years, 30 plus years, and we've had all this time to build up, many enterprises obviously are you know, 30 plus years old and have built up a lot of infrastructure. You know, by now, um, we have a lot uh, of uh, build up technical debt and we have to decide, okay, what technical debt do we eliminate here and how do we jump up? And is it mature to get into new categories of data platform? And I say, yes, to a degree. Yes, it, it indicates to me some degree of maturity if a client is already into cloud storage, if a client is already into some of the things I think are going to be uh, oldies but goodies uh, in the future, keepers, you know, artificial intelligence, master data management, stream processing, things like this, some of which I'll get into in this presentation. But it's important that you select the platform correctly, and uh, it's really important that you get into the right tool within that platform. But let's start with the platform. What is, what is it going to be used for? This is kind of one of the first decisions. These are architectural decisions here. And I suggest to you, that this is a finite list of the things that we really want to see in terms of data storage in, in, in an enterprise. An operational database, the majority of databases are operational, the majority of data stores are operational. Some of them now are for real time, and that brings its own nuance to the decision. Some of them are with big data, and that might speak to a NoSQL solution, for example. There are operational data hubs, which kind of serve as operational uh, warehouses, if you will, if you're familiar with the data warehouse and how it distributes information. That's happening now operationally because the warehouse was too late in the data cycle to be effective operationally. So some of my clients are doing that. Of course, master data management. That is an operational concept, by the way. That's an operational database, a small one, small but important. Um, and uh, there is definite decisions to be made in regards to where data belongs in master data management, in an operational data hub, in a, in a CRM, for example. So that's something that, uh, that we like to parse uh, over time. A data warehouse, of course, we're mostly going to be familiar with that, I hope, and data marts that are either dependent or independent of that data warehouse. And data mart is kind of a catch-all term. So if you don't see your, your database in here any other way, uh, it might be a data mart, but um, hopefully it's an architected data mart. And there is a difference between something that's architected, done well, you know, and something that was slapped together to just make a, just get through the day, if you will, or get something to production on time. And I do respect that as well, by the way. An analytical application or an analytic big data application, a singular application, here we're talking about uh, archive storage can be a lot of things. Staging area, probably staging for your warehouse, but maybe staging for something else. So don't get into this architecture where, well, here's the database, but it's kind of a this and a kind of a that. And, uh, you know, it should 
one, one thing that we do a lot of is, is, is re-engineer uh, environments uh, to be more sensible and more efficient over time and cost less and deliver more, et cetera. And, you know, this, this used to be called data mark consolidation, uh, where, uh, you know, an organization has sprung up so many data marts uh, to meet such small, finite purposes that there's a lot of synergy to be found by consolidating some of those data marts. And certainly that's a big part of uh, overall reengineering. But trying to get your artifacts into this list is a part of that. So take a look at what you've got, see if you can label them appropriately. And if you can't, uh, that might become a candidate for something that you can re-engineer. Now, speaking of which, re-engineering, wow, that sounds like a lot. I know you got a lot on your plate right now to deliver what you, know, what you need to deliver. I'm gonna get into this a little bit more later in the presentation, but the way to get there into the great architecture is to marry the great architecture need that you have with a, a business deliverable that you're gonna do anyway. So uh, for a lot of my clients, uh, they struggle getting into the cloud, for example. They struggle getting into big data, uh, into cloud storage for big data, et cetera. They struggle getting into master data management. It's all because you've got to cross the threshold to do that. And the, the poor person who thought they were gonna be a champion of building a data warehouse, for example, or building a great new analytic, analytical application, now finds that, oh, well, if I'm gonna be the first to move something of significance into the cloud for this organization, that's gonna actually consume more of my time and energy than to, to build the warehouse or, or the application database in and of itself. And so for that reason, many turn away from it and kind of kick that can down the road. And so I don't want you to do that. I wanna empower you. And I just want you to be aware because if you're aware going in that, oh, the cloud's a big deal, you know, you're gonna be so much better off. now. Getting into the right data platform. There are four major decisions. And actually, uh, just this morning, I was thinking, I really need to add a fifth. But let's see what I got on here already. The data store type. Do I need what the relational model brings to me? And if you're a data professional, you have to understand, or you should understand, because there are ramifications. You should understand what the relational model is. And not just, oh, it's a table. It's you know down at the data page level, you've got these consecutive columns. Uh, that comprise a row, and then you've got consecutive rows on the storage and so on. And there's ID maps and so on that map where the data is. So it's, it's helpful at getting at random access uh, to data. So it's really good for so many different things. And certainly most of the major uh, data stores out there are relational. So, but you don't need it for everything kind of 2020 going forward necessarily. Cloud storage is pretty much, I don't want to say the opposite, but it's, it's sort of void of all of that structure that the relational model has for you when it stores data. So you need it, when do you not? Well, you have to understand kind of what it is and what it gives you. Data store placement is another one. It's not so, not so simple anymore. Now, a lot of you are working under cloud mandates, I know, and so are we at our clients uh, in some cases. And in some cases, it's the opposite. It's it's uh, really, you gotta prove that the cloud is gonna be workable for this situation. Um, because, you know, my sponsors don't wanna get all the arrows and so on, so. But I think that if you know what you're doing and you, you will do it right, and that will not be a problem and you'll, you'll win the day if you do the right thing here. And a lot of times today, the right thing is definitely data store placement in the cloud. So uh, there are reasons why you wouldn't, and I think I have a slide on that a little bit later. But the third decision here is the workload architecture. There's still a distinction between operational and analytical workloads. And if you choose a database that's geared one way or the other uh, for the wrong kind of architecture, you are uh, probably asking for a bit of a world of, of hurt there. Now, it used to be 25 years ago when there was only one database, and I worked on DB2 back at IBM then. Um, in those days, we were just happy that we had a database. And, oh, we need to make a copy of this data over here for the data warehouse, but it's the same database, same, you know, DBMS, I should say. Um, but that's, uh, that's not good enough. That became quickly not good enough. And now we have significantly uh, uh, specialized databases for analytics. And it's a good thing. It gives a lot, uh, gives a lot of value uh, to be in one of those databases as opposed to an OLTP database, if I may say so, for your art analytical architecture. Finally, 
I've added, and this is just this year, really, the node architecture, because we do a ton of benchmarks uh, for our clients, uh, for the market, and so on. And we're looking at this all the time, and we're seeing this is a really big decision anymore, because you have, you have different types of high-performance uh, storage uh, architecture that you can pick from. And now that we're separating, you know, memory or, excuse me, compute from storage, um, you have to, you know, determine the profile that's right for you. You have decisions to be made there every single time and you want to do that right because that's that's a highly leverageable decision in the overall balance of things now the fifth decision that i was going to add or i will add on to this is the pricing architecture the pricing architecture anymore because you have to be uh, somewhat knowledgeable about how these things are priced and may, you know much much of the time now it's consumption based right but uh, sometimes you'll get uh, a great deal if you commit for three years. Uh, and I know you're thinking, well, I thought that was, that was not in play anymore now that we're in the cloud, but it certainly is. It certainly is. So those kinds of decisions, uh, downtime decisions are also important because, you know, if you're going to run the database 24-7 uh, and you, you, you choose the wrong database, the one that charges you by the query instead of by you know, the actual actual consumption, which, by the way, is usually around 25% or something like that for our clients. Maybe not for you, but uh, it's, it's a lot lower than some people think. But anyway, you could actually be in a world of pricing. Sorry to reuse that. But anyway, let's talk about uh, the 800-pound gorilla when it comes to platforming, and that's around these things. Data warehouses, data marts, data lakes, big data. What about that? So quickly... Data warehousing still is important. Uh, data warehousing is changing, however. It is changing in terms of being able to access different kind of levels of storage, which means different types of data than it used to. It's not all going to be necessarily strictly relational data. And I'll get into that as we go along here. But take the very best, most basic definition of data warehouse. It's a shared platform. And by the way, uh, at a at the at the uh, risk of dating myself, I went ahead and put up the, uh, the old bill in and definition here, which in my view anyway still holds true. These are great things to know about a data warehouse. Uh, but anyway, and there's another uh, Gardner Group chart I've been dragging around forever. This is kind of the old timey uh, um, slide, if you will. But it speaks volumes, right? If you have a bunch of data marts and they don't really define what that is, but we kind of know, right? Uh, over time, you know, you're just going to pay more and more for that kind of environment versus to build a data warehouse. So this idea of a shared database is very important in every enterprise. And it's important to put that on a relational model. So I've been talking a little bit about a relational model. I mentioned about the, uh, you know, the data page and how the data is uh, spread out on that data page and so on. There's ID maps to where the uh, records are located and so on. These are a lot of things that you get from relational. You don't get from anything else, okay? And certainly these have, uh, a lot of these anyway, these functions have been enhanced in, in the recent uh, explosion of databases on the market. Consistency, transactions, not that you're always doing transactions in there, but it's nice to know that they will be, uh, you know, whole. Partitioning, arrays, inheritance, you can read this as well, but some I'll point out, custom data types like JSON, XML, and so on. Um, building graph capabilities. Yes, I'm excited about this. I'm excited about the, the possibilities that graph algorithms now brings to the table. And if you want more on that, I believe uh, last month, or maybe the month, be month before, uh, which would be, what, uh, January's? I think it was December's, actually. I talked about graph databases. So if you want to go... Uh, learn more about that. Um, I had an hour on that for you back then. Um, also, on in a relational model, how you organize that data will have a lot to do with the performance of the query set that you throw at it. Now, now might be the time to talk a little bit about columnar and how that is the preferred way for analytic databases and all the big ones, you know, uh, red flags, red flags, <laughs> snowflake, red shift, and BigQuery, uh, for example, all have columnar capabilities out of the box and as a default. So they're going to store data not by row, but by column. So they're going to aggregate all the single, single columns values together, or in my group columns, 
uh, if you choose. But anyway, the point is that really facilitates the analytical query. I've done a lot of studies on this for my clients to show them that, yes, they need to spin, if you will, uh, their analytic databases to a columnar orientation. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that how you sort the data in a relational model, uh, I think I mentioned this before, but how you sort the data has a lot to do with, you know, what queries it's going to be optimized for. So design has a lot to do with it as well. So the more you know, the more you know, as they say, the, you know, the better off you're going to be going into your relational design. So if you, if you know some of the queries, great. Uh, don't assume that you're going to ever know all of them, though, and you know, kind of keep your... Uh, Keep your options open. Now, let's look at the analytic data ecosystem. I'll have a more detailed chart as we go along here, but first high level, you're going to have a data lake. Yes, I'm introducing that now. And, and I'm kind of using, okay, I, we've got to define data lake. Uh, I'm kind of using it to mean big cloud storage that is for uh, multiple consumptions. So not, it's, it's not, uh, it's like a data warehouse in that sense, but it's cloud storage, so we're, 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 we're saying big data belongs there, okay? We're also saying all data belongs there because one of the functions of the lake is going to be to push data to the data warehouse and serve as the staging area. I think that's a great use of the data lake. It's also serving data to the data scientist. Now, the data scientist uh, can go anywhere here, of course, but they tend to will spend a lot of time in your data lake. And... Uh, uh, it's important to define terms as well here to make sure that you're on the same page with whoever you're talking to. Some people will look at this and go, well, this whole thing you're showing me here, William, that's the data warehouse. You know, we, it's, it's really, it's an ecosystem or it's the logical data warehouse. Okay, I can roll with that just so I know where you're coming from. Um, I tend to speak more physically uh, as in around, uh, well, that database itself, that database is the data warehouse that data store is the data lake and so on so yeah i got to know what what you think now uh, other people will look at this whole thing and they will say well william that's the data lake uh and that's what we're calling it and i find that uh, a lot of people are excited about the term and are really building they're building a data warehouse you know in my in my terms but they're calling it a data lake so uh, again uh, hopefully you can, just like me, I'll roll with whatever you want to bring to the table there, I think, um, and uh, it's important to get on the same page with whoever you're talking to. Now, data warehouses out there today have flavors. Yeah, that's my word, uh, and this is based on a study. This was actually a published white paper I did where I found that today, uh, that idea that there's one database for the enterprise, that didn't happen. That didn't really happen so much. There can be multiple. There, sh there probably are multiple, and they fall into these categories, generally speaking, customer experience, asset maximization, operational extension, risk management, finance modernization, and product innovation data warehouses. And uh, I'm not saying everybody's going to have six <laughs> by any stretch. Uh, some of these are con consolidated, obviously, within an, an organization. But the idea that there was a one for the enterprise never really happened. Uh, it's a great goal. It's just like what I was saying before about this idea of sharing. It's great. So the more the better. But it's just hard to pull off sometimes. And it's important to keep progress moving forward. So balancing all this out um, and making good decisions and bad decisions, organizations have tended to come to uh, this point where they have flavor flavors of their data warehouse across the board. Now, they all have to, or they should, you know, work together. Uh, kind of harmoniously uh, and not have a lot of redundancy and so on. There's a lot of opportunity when you have multiple data warehouses to find some redundancy and eliminate it, create some efficiencies. May or may not be the best use of your time, but take a look at your data warehouses and it's okay if you have multiple leads. Most people do. What is required for your data warehouse it, for any modern analytical database, whether it's the warehouse or not? In database analytics, having the capability to throw some uh, analytical function at that data uh, native to the database is a, a big leg up. Now, this kind of brings up, what about in database machine learning? You know, th that's sort of out there in a mixed bag right now. I would say that is, uh, there's a lot more, what is out there is not that usable yet. So you're gonna have to augment that and bring in 
you know, your own uh, machine learning capabilities to the data uh, today anyway. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of tool sets uh, available for that. But over time, over time, in database machine learning will become very important. Uh, in memory capabilities, the columnar orientation that I spoke about, modern programming languages like Python, R, Scala, uh, TensorFlow, Spark, MLib, et cetera, those are some of the modern programming languages, languages that I want, I want to be sure this works with. And new data types, I mentioned some of those before. So make sure that your solution works with that. I talked a little bit already about the columnar orientation, so I won't belabor it here. It is quite important. Uh, back in 2013, I believe, when Redshift came out, that was the first good columnar database that was sort of at a uh, at the modern price point that we expect for data, um, and not uh, you know super huge enterprise, big time contract kind of thing. Obviously, it's in the cloud. So Amazon did this by buying the source code from a company called Par Excel. Some of you remember them. Uh, it may be a challenge to evolve that greatly at this point, but uh, they're doing a good job. And I did want to call out their columnar orientation as kind of setting the, uh, the stage for where we're at now, saying that columnar is important for all your analytics. Now, object storage instances. This is what I refer to as the data lake, right? Okay. So, and I also talked about the data warehouses changing. So this is where I get into some of that. Object storage instances and clusters have local storage, i.e. on the physical drives mounted to the instances themselves, that is HDFS and Hive. Their technologies access their cloud vendors' respective cloud storage. So Amazon EMR, for example, accesses S3, S3 kind of the granddaddy right now, I would say of cloud storage, but coming on strong is uh, coming on strong as Azure. Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which has been out, I don't know, about six months, provides a lot of advantages. And then Google Cloud Storage, of course, uh, coming on. So local storage is used by the object storage platform for its housekeeping. Um, there's also a service, serverless way with Amazon Athena, et cetera. Um, but uh, most of us are building our lakes like this. Now, what I'm suggesting is to, and I'm not the first, but I'm suggesting that you build data lakes with analytical access pricing. And how you do that is carrying a lake with an analytical engine that charges only by what you use. Otherwise, you can get into a lot of costs. Remember, I said the fifth dimension of the selection now is the pricing one, the pricing architecture. And this is where that, this is where this really comes out, okay, when you're deciding well, what data do I put into my cloud storage? What data do I put into my relational storage? Because you're going to pay a performance hit for the cloud storage for reaching in there, but you're going to obviously uh, save a lot of money on the storage uh, by a factor of four or five, something like that. So, you know, you want to, and plus it's, it's, it's only right for some unstructured data. You're not going to want to uh, force fit your unstructured data, as I have done, as we all have done, right, for the past decade, you're not going to want to try to force fit that into uh, the relational model. And by not doing that and opening up the possibility of, of the cloud storage for unstructured data, you're going, to be, you're going to be storing a lot more data. And that's going to serve you well as you go forward into this uh, artificial intelligence future. Now, here's a little uh, reference architecture, if you will. Uh, I've uh, introduced a few things now that may look different from before, but we have uh, different low latency sources. Okay, there's still a thing as source data, okay? I still call it source data if it's over there and we're bringing it over here, uh, but we're bringing a lot of that now through a Kafka or a Streamlio or a RabbitMQ or something like that uh, that's going to uh, parse this data down into its topics and through streaming or Spark send it to my data lake. That data lake is that box on the bottom there. And I am sort of suggesting that I like Parquet here, am I not? So uh, yeah, think about that as well as an orientation, an orientation for your data lake. Um, S3 is representative of whatever cloud storage that you choose to use. And notice that I have, uh, if you'll notice, I have uh, all the data, including the batch data coming on in, coming on in there to the data lake. 
Now, how does that data lake interface with my data warehouse or warehouses as the case may be? Well, the data, it, it has all the data, so the data warehouse can reach in there and grab that data and use it. Uh, uh, now, there's that performance hit I talked about. Data warehouse can also offload its data. If it's collecting data over time, it can offload some of that off to the cloud storage. However, if you jump into an architecture and you just do this, you don't have any historical data in the warehouse that's not in your data lake, but most of us do because we're not jumping into this clean. We have history in the data warehouse. So at some point, we might push that off to the data lake, whereas we, we, are not, uh, we have not sourced that data necessarily into the data lake. That's a lot of words. I hope that made sense. Um, and you're bringing the data in from the lake into the warehouse through stream processing or ETL, ELT, or kind of how we like to do it now with Spark. And yes, indeed, the querying, the dashboarding, the ad hoc stuff that is all still happening to the data warehouse and the assorted marts that gets pushed off from the warehouse. Now, this is a nice clean sheet of paper, a nice clean architecture. Uh, believe me, nobody ever presents this to me when I come to a client. So if you're saying, well, I guess we're, I guess, you know, we're, we're a lost cause because ours doesn't look like this. I haven't met the lost cause yet, so no. But uh, should we try to get it here? Yeah, we should try to get it somewhere near here, I believe. So here's some notes on the data warehouse of the future, more achievable separation of compute and storage, et cetera. I'm gonna move, push forward here because I wanna spend some time on cloud analytic databases, which I gave it the number one ribbon. It should be blue, uh, I guess, but it's number one for your workload. For most of your workloads, I say, they belong here. Analytic workloads, okay, I'm talking about analytic workloads. Uh, they belong in the cloud. They belong in a specialized cloud analytic database. There's so many uh, advantages to this. I'm gonna hopefully share some of that with you. They have robust SQL, built-in optimization on the fly, elasticity, so it will grow, the cluster will grow and shrink as necessary. Uh, keep an eye on that though, because um, Sometimes it's not exactly fluid and dynamic. It uh, can, be, can be somewhat of a stepladder approach where, oh, you need to add another terabyte. Let's add another terabyte. That's not really dynamic, uh, but some of them are still that way. So you got to throw that in the mix. Uh, I don't think that's a knockout factor, but you got to throw that in the mix. Separation of compute and storage. Um, separation of compute and storage was, was uh, really, I, I, I say popularized in the database world by Snowflake back in 2015 or so when they came out, uh, they, they, the, their stores separate, uh, you know, data from uh, compute, uh, the data being an S3, uh, you can provision any number of compute nodes, and that idea really took off uh, in 2017. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's responsible for a lot of their success, frankly, I do believe. Now, uh, of course, a lot of them uh, now do this uh, very well. Uh, so there you go. Um, what else do I want to say about it? That idea came from the Hadoop world, which, which had that already. High time the database world uh, got some of that. Cloud and lake databases in the enterprise. In the enterprise. Okay, so we're in the enterprise. What do we do? What, how do we get there? Do we put our test dev there and keep our prod on, on prem? Um, I'm, I'm saying I want you to have all this uh, in the cloud, but I get it. I get that it might be a stepwise uh, progression there. But uh, what, what's your plan? You know, that's that's my question. Is is, is to have a, what's your plan? Have a plan. Have a plan for getting where you need to go. Where, where you need to be able to step back and determine where this thing needs to go, and then marry up the projects with business success along the way. And that's the real key. That's the real key to a data leader in the enterprise today. Uh, where I, I don't have, when I talk to a, a true data leader, they already know that it's a mixed message that we're speaking as adults and we know that there's no one size fits all. And um, they realize they have to serve the business while they grow the maturity of the environment. It's not good enough, not good enough just to serve the business because they will take you down an artificial hole, <laughs> if you will, um, if you just, you know, be an order taker. Oh, we don't need that. We need real leaders in our data worlds. Okay, off that soapbox. 
performance. Managed cloud databases are the winner of all these categories here for performance. Querying cloud storage directly is inefficient. And bringing subsets of data down for on-premise processing takes time and costs egress fees. Yes, pulling data out of the lake costs them costs you some egress fees. Um, nobody can predict ahead of time exactly you know, what it's going to be, but you can get uh, kind of in the ballpark. And that's what I encourage you to do. And that's what we try to do when we uh, platform these solutions and we try to price them out. So um, point there is not don't put any data in uh, cloud storage because, oh, oh, there's a fee and there's a cost. Um, no, that's not the point. Overall, you could have some serious savings there. But um, uh, the point here is really that if you just have cloud storage, it's a data warehouse that's reaching into cloud storage. If you just have cloud storage and you just have tools that access data in cloud storage, uh, that's not going to be the most efficient. So uh, is, is a data lake, in my, in my terms, is a data lake going to replace the data warehouse? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But I do see them coming together. Performance testing on Hadoop like Hive, Spark, and Impala have shown improvements in performance, but they still lag significantly behind the performance and power of a solid relational cloud database, data warehouse. Managed cloud databases win on administration as well. Great. So I've been playing up the, or trumping up the, uh, the promise of the relational database here. So why do we need big data technologies for big data? Well, there are some reasons why cloud storage and formerly Hadoop, and I shouldn't say formally, today even Hadoop would be better than uh, a relational database for much of this. But I'm not sure why you would do that if you have cloud storage there. See, I thought, I thought that uh, Hadoop provided a nice balance of, of structure that's needed uh, for data in the enterprise. Um, I thought it, you know, clearly it wasn't near where the structure that a relational database provides, but it wasn't. It wasn't on the other end of the spectrum, basically nothing uh, in terms of what cloud storage provided. You still had, you know, the H catalog that told you where the, the, the records were. You were able to scan less than a full cluster and so on. But um, uh, I was wrong about that in terms of how they priced that, how they priced their Hadoop and so on, um, opened up a market for the cloud storage providers. And now we're seeing a bit of a scramble uh, for uh, what was Hadoop. Anyway, however, why big data technologies for big data? I mentioned new data types, schema less relaxed acid, because uh, that can be costly. Faster, less expensive provisioning, programmer freedoms. Uh, yeah, the programmer is, is uh, you know, oftentimes the data science, the data scientist is a programmer. I mean, they know how to utilize these tools. They're not just, um, you know, turning their head and, and talking to a programmer and saying, would you mind giving me this kind of data? You know, uh, no, they're doing it and they're inter interacting with it. And that's kind of where we are now. I think it'll change. I think we'll get more specialized just like we have with everything as time goes on, but that is where it is today. I can't even, as a data architect, even for my clients, I can't even say 100% what the data scientist is doing. And I don't even know if they can say 100% what they're doing with the data because it changes on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do know uh, how to provision them an environment where they get access to the data that they need. And uh, they're pretty happy with it right now. So, because the, the opposite or, or the, uh, the alternative, if you will, is uh, to not have access to data. And that would be really bad for the data science. So the data lake, let's recap a little bit on that. It's the data scientist workbench and it's also data warehouse staging. Uh, the great data lakes out there do both of these functions uh, and do them well. They are related to the data warehouse. There are many lakes that have been built um, outside of involvement uh, uh, from the data warehouse or with the data warehouse. And I think that's, uh, that's a shame because um, they, these two need to work together harmoniously. As a matter of fact, you could call the whole thing especially if you're accessing data in the warehouse and it's reaching into the lake for excess data or unstructured data, uh, et cetera, you could call the whole thing the data warehouse now. Uh, so I don't know where the label goes. I'm not really one for forging a lot of labels into the vernacular, but you know, the lake, there's, you got a lake, you got a warehouse, but they're kind of coming together here in terms of architecturally becoming 
very close cousins, I would say. So uh, that might be uh, something you need on your roadmap, which is to get them working together better. Now I've put down HDFS a bit. Uh, I am gonna give it a nod in terms of query performance. I'm gonna give it a nod in working with uh, objects of a certain size, working around those put limits that we might have in cloud storage and so on. But uh, uh, knowing what you're doing, uh, that's not the worst thing in the world. Cloud storage is more scalable and persistent. It is backed up and supports compression, making the cost of big data less. And um, yeah, it comes down to cost a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure we ever would have had a big data, a big data movement. And it's been around about a decade now, I'd say, but I'm not sure we ever would have had it had the cost of storage, you know, drop precipitously before then for other kinds of data. But anyway, so leveraging, leveraging cloud storage for data lakes. Yeah, this, these are some of the reasons why you might do that. I think I've hit on most of these. So let's talk, I can't, I can't, I, I just, I'm such a graph advocate these days that it's, it's hard for me to talk about platforming the enterprise at this level, at uh, this level of 50, a 50 minute discussion without bringing in some minutes to talk about graph databases. Now, I, I, like I said, I spent a whole hour on it some months ago, go, go get that as well, but um, I want you to identify graph workloads and think about the value of having it in a graph database or at the least utilizing the graph capabilities of your favorite relational database, which is gonna be less than what you get in a graph uh, database, but anyway. If the workload is identified by words like network, hierarchy, tree, ancestry, or structure, these are flash words to me. They, uh, they uh, immediately turn my attention to perhaps a graph database. If you're planning to use different relational performance tricks to make it happen, you might be needing a graph database. Uh, if your queries are about pathing, uh, you might need a graph database if you're looking for non-obvious patterns and so on. So, yeah, graph database, uh, many of them are stored in what's called triples, and uh, it's a beautiful thing, but um, subject, predicate, and object, we have a name, John knows Frank, et cetera. I'm not gonna get into this in any great detail. Uh, we have the nice, nice, nice visualization capabilities of graph, which sells a lot of people right there, never mind the, the triples, <laughs> but uh, they like to see their data and interact with it in that manner so that's a that's a nice thing as well but anyway so where are we going in the future well there are some future things i want to put on your horizon uh, i'm not saying that you make decisions in 2020 based upon this future however uh, i'm not saying there's any decisions i've come across in an enterprise that are worth waiting what is it now march worth waiting nine months to make um but uh these are things that um hopefully if you're in a bigger enterprise, you have some R&D devoted to looking at this and being ready when the time comes because the early adopter is going to get a lot of the benefits of doing this. Doing what? Doing GPU databases. For example, a GPU database is like CPU on steroids. Um, they actually work with CPUs, but anyway, uh, there you see some of the names that are in this category. Uh, I'm watching this space carefully. Uh, GPU databases, spatial analytics. You can query and visualize billions to trillions of near real-time objects. These are things that you just just don't do today. Now, many of us don't have data that big, where that's actually going to be a thing, but many of us do. And uh, I, I encourage everybody to think broadly about, you know, your data abilities uh, as an organization. And if nothing else, think about third-party data that you could be bringing in. All that data that you've been leaving behind or you've been ignoring because, well, nobody's asking for it, uh, that's not good enough anymore. Um, not good enough. Uh, leadership de demand that we look at the artificial intelligence future and start get, getting all that data under control. And if you do that, I think the market's gonna move towards these GPU databases. Keep an eye. Type A organizations may want to deploy now, and that goes for operolytical, Databases, if I may use that word, okay? Uh, I did mention at the outset of this presentation that, you know, there is a divide between operational and analytical. There is a divide between operational and analytical still, for the most part, but uh, some of the IoT, some of the graph 
things that we're doing. Uh, I'm having a hard time categorizing so distinctly anymore. And so these alphabetical databases could come in handy. They could actually serve some organizations even broader than the operalytical uh, actual um, application because it can do both row-based for transactions and column-based for analytics. And uh, that's the best of both worlds right there. Now, does it duplicate the data? Uh, yes, uh, it does, but it does it under the covers, and that's a, that's a big benefit. And process both orders and machine learning models simultaneously with fast performance and reduced complexity. What else? What else is out there in the future? Well, um, I see that enterprises are going to move towards, you know, you know, this architecture that I've been, been showing you here, different pieces of, there might be multiple of those in the future in your enterprise that work together. And how might they be divided? They might be divided by enterprise domain. So I see a future with decent, more decentralized, more decoupled distributed architecture. So data infrastructure is like a platform with complete domain mastery as the nodes of that platform. Hopefully you're seeing the, you're getting the visual um, as, I, as I say this. But um, I definitely see things getting more complicated before they get less complicated. I don't know when they get less complicated in our world. Uh, it's going to uh, take some time. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you're going to, we're going to go through things like this. We're going to have enterprise master data management, Master data management is clearly going to be important for our future. It's important today. Uh, and those who don't embrace it are really, I think, suffering. And sometimes they know, sometimes they don't. In the future, nobody's solved the Federation challenge that, 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 that I just now speak of. Uh, someone will, and that could be a really big thing. Moving away from conventional integration and its technical debt and effort, more streaming, more Kafka stuff, uh, for sure. Containerization, microservice databases, and embedded database. Embedded databases as part of the analytics environment. Embedded databases, it's not just for software anymore. It's for the things that you build inside an enterprise. Yes. And embedded databases uh, as distinct from just using raw data in your enterprise. And, uh, you know, ex extend this. Uh, let's say we're doing an IoT architecture. Extend it out to the edge, out there in that edge, having a real embedded uh, database out there. Yes, that's uh, part of our, our future. Integration, speed uptake, and maturity. Eliminating redundant data stores. And dare I say, eliminating a lot of the work effort that's involved today in integration, because a lot of that has been done. And finally, the unification of batch and streaming and tools is something of the future. So, uh, such as, Apache Beam or Google Cloud Data Flow. These are these are these are things that are here today, but definitely the market's going to go more in that direction. But again, again, if you're out, if you're if you if you leave this presentation at the top of the hour and go back to work and go back to uh, you know platforming what you got in front of you, mm, I don't don't think too much about this. But every once in a while, as a data professional in a fast moving market. Uh, you have to uh, take a look out there. And I do that. I do that on a regular basis. And this is kind of where I'm at with that. So something for you to think about. That brings me to the end of this part of the presentation. I still have time for your Q&A here, a few minutes. And I'll pass it back to Shannon to direct that. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. Uh, we do have some questions coming in, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. So, William, um, do I need to consider the uh, ingestion type, uh, for example, batch versus stream, or into the architectural decision? Um, okay, well, yes. Uh, but is it, is it separate from the platform decision? Uh, the question said architecture. I have to say yes to that. Um, I'm not so sure about the platforming decision, uh, but there, you have to architect your ingest today. It used to be that that wasn't that important. That was pretty much what it was going to be. But uh, now that we're ingesting IoT data, we're, you know, we're ingesting uh, yeah, data velocities that you know, we never even thought about before. 
uh, it's important to yeah architect your ingest. And I think if you do that, you will find that ETL tools, the ELT tools are going to be insufficient for the modern workload. And that's where you get into uh, streaming. Great. And should uh, cost be considered also as a disruption vector? Uh, yes. Um, yes, it is. Yes, certainly it is disrupting the market. Certainly it's something uh, at that level that we look at uh, when choosing a platform that, that you should look at when you're choosing a platform. Uh, you should put your workloads up against it and you should know, am I running, you, you know, how much are you running? Is consumption based right? Is serverless pricing uh, kind of right? Like what, you know, BQ does and, and solutions like that. So um, I heard it said not too long ago, and I've picked up on this, um, um, that how we as database professionals uh, were now valued for our design abilities uh, in, with databases. And, but in the future, we're going to be valued for our ability to be true. And uh, the options have opened up. So you definitely want to consider that a dimension of your selection. So which solution works or is successful implementing operational analytics database space column and row? Uh, column and row. What are the options there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a few. DB2 is stepping into that area uh, somewhat. Um, I'm talking about the popular ones. Um, we like uh, we like uh, we have Actian, uh, Exasol. Uh, MemSQL, okay. Uh, these are all claiming some some ground there and are worth looking at. Take a take a particular look at uh, at MemSQL and its ability to do both uh, and do it well and seamlessly and you know step up to those challenges and really um, it, it makes its case. It makes its case for doing more than just that a application. Uh, in the enterprise. Uh, for some smaller enterprises that, that want to standardize on one database, which is almost unheard of anymore, <laughs> but um, you know, if you're going to standardize on one, um, please don't. But if you're going to, um, you know, you can think about these solutions as being pretty paramount in that. And where do you look to see the future of tech and options? Where do I look to see the future? Um, well, uh, I do these analyst days um, at various vendors, so I try to get to them. Um, I take in as much information as I possibly can. I have uh, Feedly set up uh, with RSS, I guess formerly known as RSS kind of feeds, where I have my, the, you know, the keywords of things that I'm following, uh, and I hit that every day, every day, and I see what's going on out there, and I think. You know, I don't just absorb information and reiterate. I think about it, and I think about how it fits with all the other information I'm getting. I'm not saying it's any better or worse than anybody else's, but um, that's kind of how I do it. I just make sure that I invest the time in the, in the future. Um, I have a network that is uh, second to none in this space, and so uh, whenever we can get together and bounce ideas off each other, that's very helpful to me as well. All right, we have a minute here, but I'm going to, so I'm going to try and slip in this last question. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on decentralized architecture for enterprise master data management? I've seen many centralized designs. Why the decentralized architecture is the trend? Pros and cons? Yeah, well, that, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> but um, <I> know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, so master data management is 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 very interesting because um, it, it does so it has it has so much value to the organization. But you you as, as the MDM champion in your organization, you have to pick the right level to hit the organization with this because you don't want to go too big because it'll never happen. You don't want to go too small because you're not really delivering anything of value. You know, it's not really MDM to me if you're just supporting one application if you're just decoupling. Uh, the master data from an application and doing it over here instead of over, over there, you know, in terms of the team and stuff like that. But um, so when you when you find that happy balance, and let's say it's not the entire organization that you serve with your MDM uh, hub, and you're you're getting some traction, you've done customer, you've done product, it's great, you know, this 
let's say the, uh, the, uh, the, the domestic business loves it, but then you got that international business kind of sitting out there and they don't have it. Well, are they going to jump in here? That might be too hard. So maybe they build their own. And so we're now starting to decentralize uh, what was what is supposed to be a centralized function. But you know what? That's okay because you, you're getting things done. And so, uh, you know, you should not listen to anybody who says this is the one way to do it, the only one way. And you should not listen to anybody that says if you're not hitting the entire enterprise with this, you're doing it wrong. Yes, that's nice to have. Uh, and yes, that's great. But I'm out here in the real world, you know, trying to spin up projects and get them going and, and get companies moving in the right direction. So you got to know how to use your judgment and, um, and find the balance in things. And that, that is leading us to decentralized architectures. I love it. It's very well answered in a very short time. Well, thank you, William, again for another fantastic presentation, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording. And I hope you all have a great day. Stay safe out there. Thanks, William. Thanks, all. Thank you. Bye-bye.